Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Annie. So I don't know about you, but did you feel this morning like someone had robbed an hour of your time? Yeah, did you feel that way? Yeah, I know I did. So I think we're in good company. So if you feel like you have been robbed of an hour of your time, I've got some very good news. Because I've been thinking about how we can get this time back this week. And I have a couple thoughts, I have a couple suggestions, I have a couple ideas how you can buy back some of your time, how you can get some of this time back. The first idea that I came across was this little device. This is a robot that vacuums your house. The beautiful thing about this robot is you can hook it up to your phone and your Wi-Fi, and while you're at the grocery store, while you're at soccer practice, while you're at work, you can just program your computer to vacuum your house. I mean, think of all the time that you could save, right? Someone in our cul-de-sac bought one of these and it just went around the whole cul-de-sac and everyone checked it out. It was great. Think about all the time that you could save. But if you don't want to go in that direction, uh, I have another suggestion. So most of you, you've got washers, right? And you've got dryers, right? But do you have this machine? This is a Foldamate. Yes, you heard that correctly. It's a foldamate. And so you put your clothes in the washer, and then you put them in the dryer, and then you put them in the foldamate, and it actually folds your clothes. And so when we do laundry at our house, we do like six loads at a time. Think of all the time that you could save if you had a foldamate. If you don't like that idea, we've got more ideas. Uh, perhaps you are into working and you're also committed to working out. But with all the time that you're spending at the office, you don't have time to work out. And so there have been some creative people that have put working and working out together. They have created a treadmill and a desk so that you can work as you work out. I mean, think of the time that you could save. Yeah, think of the way that you could also kill yourself if you were like so enthralled that you forgot what you were doing and you forgot that you were on your treadmill. Okay, if that doesn't work, then I've got some more ideas. Two more. Okay, <laughs> this is actually called a head case. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, they named it correctly. You've been there, I've been there, we've been at the airport, we've checked our baggage, and we stand at the carousel watching uh, for our bag to come out. And you just watch and you watch and you watch and you watch and you recognize that everyone else has bags that look like you. Literally, the last time I checked my bag, I had to track down the lady who grabbed my bag and was leaving and I had to say, excuse me ma'am, you've got my bag. But if you get a, haste, uh, a head case, this will never happen. So you take a picture of what your face looks like, you send it to the company, they'll send you this apparatus, you strap that onto your suitcase, you'll never lose it again. But you will get some really strange looks as you cart it out of the airport. All right, I, I really feel bad about this next one because ladies, we're leaving you out of all this time saving. And uh, men, uh, only the good looking ones in this room like me that have beards will be able to take full advantage of this. I actually have no idea what this thing is called, so I'm just calling it the beard bib. Yeah, you heard it, the beard bib. So guys, you know like when you're trimming up in the morning and uh, you get your little trim hairs everywhere, and then you know uh, the countless hours that you spend like cleaning up and scrubbing the sink and scrubbing, yeah, 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 I, yeah, I saw one. I'm not going to say who, but one of the wives went, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's a possibility. My husband could actually clean up after himself. Well, with a beard bib, you actually don't need to. You just strap this, babe, this big boy on, and you do your trimming, and then you take it over to the trash can, and then you empty it out in the trash can. It's beautiful. Think of all the time that you could save. Although, I have no idea how much time it does takes to fold this thing back up and to put it neatly away, but... Uh, a lot of time saved here. So if you haven't guessed it already, today we are talking about time. We're talking about time, which is good because we just lost an hour worth of our precious time today. We're in this series called Believe, in which we are looking at 30 of the key principles of living a Christian life. Today we're stopping and we're pausing and we're looking at this gift of time that God has given us. The big idea that we're wrestling with is this, that we need to offer our time to fulfill God's purposes. That's the big idea. I offer my time to fulfill God's purposes. 
The question that we're asking is this, how do I best use my time to serve God and others? How do I best use my time to serve God, and how do I best use my time to serve others? And the key scripture comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 17. Paul says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And finally, the key application we're going to be asking at the end is, what difference does this make in the way that I live? Because if we just come to church, and if we just hear from God's word, and if we leave exactly the way that we came, and if we act exactly the way that we came, then maybe God's word is not sinking into our life deep enough. God's word intends to be lived out. And so we're just asking the question, what difference is this going to make in the way that I live? So when we're looking at time, and we're asking these key questions about how do I best use my time to serve God and serve others, I think the first place to begin is understanding that time is a gift from God, that God has given us this gift of time. So our proper understanding is understanding that time is a gift from God. Now, two weeks ago when we gathered, we were reminded that gifts have certain qualities. They have the quality of surprise. They have the quality of, of, of expectation. The person who gives that gift, well, they are eager for that person to receive that gift and to open it up and to use it to benefit their own lives and to benefit the lives of others. But time is a gift from God. In the book of James, James reminds us that every good gift comes from God. He says this in James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not sh change like the shifting shadows. Did you see what James says? He says, every good and perfect gift is from God. And so the time that you have been given, it is a gift from God. Now we were reminded that gifts, you don't earn your gifts, you simply receive your gifts. You don't deserve the gifts that you're given. They're simply given to you because someone loves you and cares for you and wants to see you enjoy the gift that has been given. So our starting place is just to recognize that we receive the gift of time with open hands. We have not earned it. We don't deserve it. We simply receive it. And yet, God gives us this gift. Day after day after day after day, God gives us this gift. Now, there is a certain element of surprise to a gift, right? When you open it up, you're not sure what it's going to look like. You're not sure what it's going to mean. You're not, going, you're not sure how you're going to incorporate it into your life. Well, it's a little bit like that with time. Because none of us is sure how much time God is going to give to us. And so we are reminded to use each day wisely. Two weeks ago, we were reminded that when we receive these gifts, it's also good to look at the heart of the giver. Because gifts that are given well come to us because we are well loved. And so as God gives you day after day after day after day, this gift comes to you because God loves you. God wants you to receive this gift of time. God wants you to use this time, gift of time. God wants you to enjoy this gift of time. But God also wants you to use this gift so that other people would enjoy who God is and the life that he is inviting them into. And so we start recognizing that, that gift, that time is a gift from God. As we continue to look at this gift of time, we want to recognize that we are to use this time wisely, not foolishly. Paul is very clear about this when he is writing to the church in Ephesus. He says this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most out of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. 
The way that this is translated in the, in the New Living Translation, it sounds like this. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most out of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So when Paul is writing, he's not writing to the church in the English language. He's writing to the church, and he's using Koine Greek. Now, Koine Greek, it's a very complex language. It's a very rich language. It has lots of layers. You can read this and, and derive many different meanings. And so when Paul's talking about time, in the Greek language, there are two different ways to understand time. There is chronos time. That's where we get the word chronology. Those are the, the seconds, the minutes, the days. That's calendar time. That's a sequence of events. That's one kind of time that Paul could be referring to. But he's not talking about chronos time. He's talking about kairos time. Kairos time means to seize the moment, to look for an opportunity, to recognize that there are these once-in-a-lifetime opportunities that you will have, and that you are to seize these opportunities, you are to use these opportunities, you are to receive these opportunities to advance God's kingdom. And so when Paul is talking to the church, he's talking about this chronos time. He's saying, He's saying, seize these opportunities to advance God's kingdom. Now, for those of us who have lived, we recognize that we really don't have that much chronos time, but we have even fewer kairos moments. And so we are encouraged to look for these opportunities to engage with what God is doing. Paul says, be very careful how you live. Be very careful. It's interesting that he's starting off just giving a warning. And if you're a parent, you've said these words before. Hey, be careful. Be careful. Every single morning, these words come out of my mouth. Hey, be careful. Because out of our four children, and we have one child that he'll just stack everything that he has up on his plate, and then he'll just run off and just uh, put it into the sink. And he's not very careful, and so we just remind him over and over again, be careful. Austin, I'm not going to mention his name, but one of our sons, we have to say, <laughs> I sure hope he's not listening to this sermon, be careful. But it's just a slight warning, because typically a cup will hit the floor, a knife will go tumbling off, a fork will not make it to the sink. And still we say, be careful. But I could use those same words if, if this son were crossing, say, Shawnee Mission Boulevard during rush hour traffic. I would say, hey, you need to get to the other side. I want you to be careful. Those are the same words, right? But does it mean the same when I'm just talking about getting his silverware to the sink or crossing Shawnee Mission Boulevard? No. The kind of language that we hear here is this strong language, this steep warning. The stakes are high. This is the same kind of language that Jesus uses when he says, be on your guard. Don't let anyone, don't let anyone distract you from the kind of life that God is calling you to live. There are so many people that will try to distract you, hinder you, create barriers so that you do not accomplish the things that God wants you to accomplish. And so be on your guard. That's the kind of language that Paul is using. Be very careful, he says, on how you live. He goes on to say, make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity. Look for these kairos moments. Look for these moments where God wants to break into your life, break into your day, break into the moment, and unlock a door that you did not see was there. He's saying, make the most of your time. Make the most of these moments. The language that he's using here, it's strong language. 
If you read it in the original Greek, he would say, buy back these moments, redeem the time. And we know what it looks like when you see something on sale and you just jump on it, you pounce on it, because you know that that sale is not going to be there tomorrow. That item is not going to be there tomorrow. And so you grab a hold of it. Well, this is how Paul is encouraging us to live. I think the problem that I have, and maybe the problem that you have, is I look at my calendar, I look at my schedule, and it's just packed. I run from one event to the next event to the next event to the next event to the next event. And when I look at my Kronos time, it's just packed. It's full. I'm overscheduled. I'm overbooked. And when you're overscheduled, when you're overbooked, when you're just going from one activity to the next activity to the next activity to the next activity, how often are you able to see God opening a door that he's never opened before? Or God having you encounter a person that you need to connect with? How often are you open to hearing God's still, small voice? And so we're beginning a journey in the fall in which we're just asking the question, what would it be like if we reoriented our calendar, if we reoriented our checkbook? Because I can tell you what is important to you by the way that you spend your time. And I can tell what is important to you by the way that you spend your money. And if you're like me, there's this disconnect from the things that we want to do with God and the things that we are actually doing. And so in the fall, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to pause and we're going to ask the question, God, how do we create more margin in our lives? How do we create more space in our lives to hear from you and to reorientate the way that we think about our finances and the way that we think about our time so that we can more faithfully partner with you as we join you in the work that you're already doing of advancing your kingdom. Paul tells us that we need to be careful, that we need to be wise in the way that we spend our time. Why? Because we live in evil days. I mean, all you need to do is you need to turn on the news and you will see heartbreak and you will see brokenness and you will see destruction and you will see pain and you will see shame, and you'll see a lot of blame. I don't think I need to talk very much about the days that we're living in. I don't think I need to build a case that this life that we're living right now, it doesn't resemble the life that God intends for us to live. That's why we pray the Lord's Prayer every week. So we don't forget that God wants us to live in a way that would expand his kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How do we get there? We get there by investing our time wisely. By looking for God in his activity and joining him in these kairos moments. The last thing that Paul says in verse 17 is, that we should not be foolish. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. When you dig into this word, foolish, when you break it apart, what it really means is it means don't live like someone who does not acknowledge God. Don't live like someone that doesn't acknowledge God. As Christians, we're on a journey to acknowledge God in every area of our lives. That especially counts when it comes to our time. Yesterday, I had a beautiful moment. Uh, many of you haven't met Fred Dermer, but he's been a member here for an awful long time. The last time I saw him, we were celebrating his 90th birthday, and so he's seen a lot of life. It was beautiful to sit with him in the hospital room yesterday and just to reflect about his life and to have this man who's in the last stages of his life just look at me and say, I've, I've got open hands. I'm not fretting about anything. I am at peace. And I think about how he got to that place. It's because he knows Jesus, and he loves Jesus, 
and he has been offering his life and his time and his resources to the things of God. I wish I could say that my encounters were always like that, that I got to sit and I got to relax and enjoy and soak in these special moments. But more often than not, when I am with people during their last days, their last weeks, their last months, there is so much anxiety. There is so much regret. There is so much disappointment. And often what I hear is, I just wish I could go back and do things over differently. But Paul reminds us that we only have so much time. And so we are to live. We are to seize these opportunities. We are not to live foolishly. But we are to consider what God's will is. So we recognize we recognize that time is a gift from God. We recognize that there are different kinds of time and that we want to be open to these Kairos, Kairos moments that God has for us. We also want to look at Jesus and we want to ask the question, how did Jesus use his time? Because I've thought a lot about Jesus, especially this last weekend, how Jesus used his time. I mean, I know we're busy people. I know we have a lot on our agenda. I know that our to-do list and our priority list, they're packed, but I don't think anyone of us has been given the task of redeeming humankind, saving the earth, reconciling God to man. I mean, none of us has that responsibility. Except Jesus had that responsibility. And when you look at his life, I'm surprised to see at the way that he lives his life. He spends lots of time praying. He spends lots of time reflecting. He spends time napping. He also travels. He also encounters people. He preaches. He heals. But at no time in the scripture do I see Jesus rushing around. I've never gotten the sense that Jesus has double booked himself or is overcommitted or overscheduled or behind schedule. I just don't see it. I don't see Jesus running from place to place. Now, as a church, we're committed to being like Jesus. And as parents, you're committed to raising your children to be like Jesus. And so I love what I hear when you're talking to your kids. You're saying, don't run, kids. Not at church. Don't run. Please don't run. And I know the reason that you're saying that is because you want your kids to be just like Jesus. <laughs> because Jesus didn't run. He didn't hustle. He didn't hurry. He didn't need to because he had the proper understanding of who God was and he had the proper understanding of what he was called to do. There's a passage in Mark 5 that I think is just so astounding. Jesus is teaching and Jesus is teaching and he gets the news. Uh, I'm not going to read this passage, but if you have time this afternoon, it's a good passage. It gives us a picture of what Jesus' life looked like with God. So Jesus is teaching and he's preaching and, and there's a request that comes to him. Jairus comes and, and Jairus has a daughter and she is on death's doorstep. And he knows that Jesus can heal her. And so this desperate man comes to Jesus and says, Would you come to my house? Would you heal my daughter? If you don't, she will die. And Jesus doesn't drop everything. Jesus doesn't rush off. Jesus doesn't put it in high gear. The text says, And he went. But he's going through this crowd of people. And as he is making his way to Jairus' house to heal Jairus' daughter, there is something that happens. Now, we've talked about Kairos time, and we've talked about Kronos time. Jesus has a Kairos moment. Now, the clock is t ticking, and as Jesus is making his way to Jairus' house, he encounters someone else. Well, there is a woman who has this rare condition where she is bleeding and she has spent all of her money and she has run through all of her options and because of her illness because of her disease she is outside the community well she also has a need and she knows if she can get to Jesus then maybe Jesus can heal her and so in the midst of this crowd she just scoots up to Jesus and in faith she just reaches out to touch him 
just to touch his coat, just to touch his garment, believing in faith that if she does that, she will be healed. So Jesus is on the way to heal this girl, to rescue her from death, and he's touched. Now, you would think that he needs to be in such a hurry to get to this girl that he's not going to let anything get in his way. But as soon as he is touched, he just stops everything. And he turns around and he asks, Who touched me? Who touched me? You see, Jesus is in the middle of having a Kairos moment. I don't think I would have had that presence. I'd be so focused on getting to that house and saving that person that I wouldn't be aware of what God was also up to in my life. He stops and he has this beautiful conversation with this woman that no one noticed. This woman that was also in great need. This woman who was hurting and needed to be helped. Now, God orchestrated this. God created this opportunity. And Jesus realized this opportunity. I just wonder in my life, and I wonder in your life, if we're just so busy, just rushing to the thing that we think we are supposed to arrive at, that we miss these golden opportunities to seize these moments, these kairos moments, so that God's work can continue in our lives, and in the lives of others. Ultimately, what Paul is asking us to do is to live like Jesus. Ultimately, what Paul is asking us to do is to offer up our lives, all of our seconds, all of our minutes, all of our hours, all of our days, Again, our key verse comes from Colossians, chapter 3, verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What Paul is asking us to do is to invest everything, to offer up everything, every moment, every second, every day, every opportunity so that we can partner with God, so that we can advance God's kingdom. Now, we're not going to be able to solve all of this here and now, but I think this is a good starting place. In the fall, we are going to slow down, and we are going to pause, and we are going to do some heavy lifting as we reorganize and reprioritize our calendars. But today, the questions I have for you are, are this. When you think about your time, what are the descriptive words that come to mind? Because your time says a lot about you. The way that you invest your time, the way that you spend your time, it highlights what's important to you. And so, what would be some of the words that you would use to describe the way that you spend your time? The second question asks, what does the way you use your time say about who you really are and what really matters to you? The third thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to continue to think about Jesus and ask the question, how did Jesus make the most of these Kairos moments? And if Jesus is our leader, if he is our guide, if he is our example, then what can we learn from him about identifying these moments and then maximizing them? How can you offer your time as an act of worship? And then finally, this week, what will you do to reorient your calendar to fulfill Jesus' mission? I want to encourage you to spend some time in prayer, some time thinking about what we've discussed, some time looking at these passages, some time asking God to speak to you so that you can start taking more steps to reorient your life.
so that it matches Christ's life. God, we do thank you for this gift of time. We thank you for the opportunity to gather and hear from your word and to be encouraged and also to be challenged. God, we pray that we would continue to wrestle with these challenging things, these hard things, and that ultimately we would come back to the place after we have wrestled, after we have struggled, that we would come back to the place of just simply offering our best, offering our all, offering up everything back to you. And so that we pray that you would take us just as we are and that you would continue to change, restore, and redeem us so that we become more like you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.